All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Dan Falkenstrom. I'm the operations director here at the Tech Valley Center of Gravity, the Makerspace Manufacturing Incubator and STEAM Education Center. And this is our Hatched, uh, the Capital District Inventors and Entrepreneurs Meetup. Uh, so we meet uh, the first Thursday of every month, and it's generally aimed at product developers or anyone working on hardware. Uh, so we'll host either sharing nights or speaker nights. Sharing nights are much more low key. Uh, we'll have people coming in, talk about products or projects that they're working on, any problems that they're running into, and then as a group, we'll work at brainstorming solutions or coming up with different ideas. Uh, so that's mostly what we do uh, at those meetups. And then occasionally, we'll host a speaker night, like tonight. So uh, tonight, we're very fortunate to have Bob Bedard from the AI Center of Excellence joining us tonight to talk about plans uh, for that. Uh, so like back when we first started uh, the Makerspace, we had a lot of meetings talking about you know, what does the community want to see out of a makerspace? Who wants to contribute? Anyone have any ideas? So that's kind of what we're going to be looking to do tonight, is really have more of a conversation about uh, what people are interested in seeing the, the center kind of developing into. A um, couple shout outs. So first, again, thanks to, to Bob, the AI Center of Excellence, de facto global Intelligize AI for uh, supporting this event. Uh, also, Adam uh, from Monotical. Say that right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, doing a lot of support to help this make this event happen. Uh, also, big thank you to Agora Media, Richard Lynn, for handling the live stream uh, and all of our photo and uh, videography. We do a lot here at, at the COG. Also, want to thank all of the major sponsors that help make the center of gravity possible. Uh, we wouldn't uh, exist without our, our sponsors and donors. Uh, specifically, I'd like to call out thanks to uh, NYSTAR and Empire State Development. Center for Economic Growth, also Vlon Studios as being some of our star sponsors. I just wanted to give a couple updates about the Center of Gravity uh, in case you might have missed our uh, State of the Cog meeting uh, a couple months ago. So we've, we're always looking to make improvements to our capabilities uh, at, here at, at the Makerspace, uh, especially things around digital fabrication. So, this past year, we added a couple new pieces of CNC equipment, specifically a new three-axis CNC mill, as well as a CNC plasma cutter. Uh, we've also finally been able to add 3D scanning uh, technology, so both in handheld laser scanners and also a uh, laser pharo measuring and scanning arm, um, and also a bunch of smaller pieces of equipment, so like a brand new wood lathe and just other pieces of, of hand tools throughout, throughout the facility. Also, hopefully in July, we'll be adding some acoustic modifications to this room uh, to help knock down the echo, which has been a, a big problem for a long time. So uh, July will be, yeah, we're looking forward to that. So we actually have two of our members, PhD candidates up at RPI in, in uh, acoustics. Uh, so they're helping modeling this room for us and giving us a full custom solution. So that's going to be fantastic. Uh, and also thank you to everyone who donated to our Giving Tuesday campaign, which is going to pay for the materials to, to make that happen. We're also launching some new membership tiers, actually just started at the beginning of this year, specifically aimed towards businesses and kind of acting on some feedback we've been hearing over the years. Uh, so in addition to our uh, typical maker and super maker hobbyist memberships, uh, we have our professional maker membership. So this is specifically for existing businesses starting at $150 a month. Uh, so this adds not only 24-7 access to the space, uh, but also discounts on uh, equipment use rates, uh, discounts for multiple employees, uh, as well as being able to rent specific square footage uh, for any manufacturing businesses or hardware businesses uh, that want to rent physical space within the building. Also, our incubated maker membership. Uh, so this is really the same incubator program that we've had for the past couple years, just reformatted slightly. Uh, so that's $135 a month, same features as the professional maker, uh, but also adds mentorship and uh, some more program guidance uh, along with that. So you'd be assigned an individual uh, mentor, as well as you get support from COG staff, uh, and then also you're uh, eligible for some uh, state tax incentives uh, for startups. 
both these memberships and they're uh, available or they're able to rent some of our innovation spaces that we have uh, in the basement and some space up here. We also have the ability to rent out office spaces upstairs in the Quackenbush and bundle those office spaces with membership uh, at, the, at the COG. Also new this year, we're adding prototyping services. Uh, so specifically for metal parts that would be compatible with a CNC mill or a CNC lathe, those are gonna be available to those new membership levels. Uh, so that's pretty exciting that, that we're able to, to add that. We also have a couple other members of the innovation ecosystem here tonight. Uh, one person who could not be here, uh, but wanted me to just pass along a quick update. So Brody from NYSTEX Ignite You, which exists upstairs in this building. Uh, she wanted me to let everyone uh, know that they are hosting their business growth accelerator, uh, specifically for certified MWBEs in the construction industry. So if you would like to learn more about that, you can visit their website, igniteuny.com. So also here today, we have Dong from CEG. Um, do you want to give us just maybe just a quick little blurb about what CEG does and maybe anything that you might have coming up soon? Thank you. Also, we have uh, Tom Reynolds from the SBDC. Thank you. Uh, we also have Corey Aldrich from the Upstate Alliance for the Creative Economy. No problem. Um, we didn't get to talk to you earlier, but would you like to say anything about the Tech Valley Game Space? Sure. So, Jamie Stevenson from the Tech Valley Game Space. <laughs>
All right. Uh, so before turning it over to Bob, uh, we asked uh, people when they came in if they wanted to mention what they're interested in learning about tonight. Um, just kind of quick running through the questions people were, were asking, uh, what kinds of resources Bob needs to achieve his mission. What does someone need to do to own a building for a nonprofit serving youth, seniors, and, community, and a community kitchen? What knowledge and skills do we most need to share with K-12 students, RE AI? Uh, what needs to be done to get past limitations, LLMs, uh, being uh, dependent on existing corpses? Corpuses? <laughs> Purposes. <laughs> How can we? <laughs> Uh, how can we connect the local AI and game developer we'll communities? <laughs> All right, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Bob. Thank you very much, everyone. Nice job, Dan. Clicker. Yep, so That's I have it. about 20 minutes. Adam's going to keep me honest here. Uh, my goal is to set very low expectations here, very low expectations, <laughs> because I've tried it the other way, and it's a little tricky. So my goal here is to really uh, just give you a quick background on uh, the AI Center, sort of what, how, it, how the idea came about. And then a bit, we're doing a little bit of a reset because we started down the path a few years ago. COVID hit and things went sideways. We're always trying to uh, restart up again, uh, particularly with, with the open AI stuff and everything else. It's probably more important now to do this stuff than ever. Uh, it's really important, I think. The, the goal is to really try to see if we could uh, nurture an ecosystem around AI in the Capital District, and even maybe a little bit loftier is to see if we could have a, a Capital District strategy for AI. Uh, we may or may not achieve that, but if we achieve any goals along the way, that'd be great. Um, so the really, the, the important part about this, I think, today is that, you know, I think AI has been moving towards commercialization pretty quickly over the last seven, eight, nine, ten years. Uh, I have a software product that um, I, Started building AI into about seven years ago. Um, yes, and so it's a it's a software company. It's a data analytics uh, and planning product, and we were the first company to integrate this with uh, Azure Machine Learning way seven or eight years ago. So we worked with Microsoft. We build models because we do financial forecasting, right? It's a perfect, it's a natural, and it became clear to me then that you know AI technology is becoming much more commercialized, available to to organizations. Uh, so I, was, I had the company down in Connecticut. I moved up, up here about six years ago, primarily to tap into RPI, the analytics uh, resource, AI resources in, in, at RPI, because I was down in Connecticut and I didn't want to compete with hedge funds and those guys, and pay people a lot of money. Figured I'd be take the cheap route. And in fact, it worked out really well, because I came up here and started uh, hiring interns, and they started building models, and it was pretty cool. And uh, so it really got some real engagement, but it also gave me the chance to kind of look around the area and realize, wow, there's a lot of disparate resources in the capital district. And it's really underperforming, quite frankly. And so I thought, wow, maybe I can take a run at trying to create a little community around AI. Uh, that would be a little self-serving, quite frankly, but also serve the community. And so that brought me down this path. And uh, it's been an interesting path. So, uh, so I... Um, about six years ago, five, six years, I came up with the idea of, hey, I, so I defined, spent a lot of time defining what this would be all about. So uh, developed a mission, and the idea was really for it to sort of be a, uh, a driver of an ecosystem in the capital district. Uh, and it would, and would house startups and, and, and drive competency in the community, et cetera, et cetera. I've got this really interesting little, uh, little graphic here, which really outlines sort of the scope of what the AI Center was really intended to be. And so, down below, it's really about literacy, right? It's like, how do you teach people what AI is? When I would go around and give presentations, they basically, they, AI was like the last thing they saw in a science fiction movie, right? Because nobody really touched it as a technology. It had all this great promise. It had people were fearful of it. Um, so first thing is like, if we're going to build an ecosystem, we all have to speak the language. So let's try to in, implement some kind of literacy program 
and we started talking with, um, with different organizations about how can we run programs out K through 12 and, and start to educate the community. So certainly part of what my goal was to really try to drive literacy uh, within the community. And with literacy, when you develop skills, you, have time, you, you, build, you match literacy with, with skills, you develop competency, you develop competency, you can really start doing good things, right? So the way that we're gonna build an AI competent community is starting with literacy. And so that's what we started doing and, and types of programs that we defined, uh, uh, including internship programs. Um, but the other piece of it is really that kind of leads to economic growth, right? So I know you have an AI literate community, they can actually start doing things, we can, we can start to, uh, we can start empowering the local companies to start applying AI to their businesses and they become more competitive and, and then we, we have some startups, et cetera, et cetera. It all starts to build onto itself. So really, uh, so again, the goal of the, of the center was really to begin to nurture those types of things. And then finally, since we're right across the river from all those folks that are making laws and New York State loves to be out in front of a lot of these things, but most legislators have no clue what AI is about, we thought, well, we can be a mechanism to help them understand what it's really about and even you know, provide input in terms of policies and those kinds of things. So we figured that's kind of the scope of what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, it's easy to put graphics together. It's a little more difficult to actually make this happen. And so, <laughs> so making life even more complex, I decided, oh, why don't I go buy an old building that I know nothing about? So anyway, so what am I doing right now? What work needs to be done? Well, first of all, the goal here is to kind of restart and even engage a little bit with the community, start to try to identify people who want to participate or, or just general uh, interest in terms of what we're doing and, um, and see if we can really kind of build a little bit of a community here. Uh, let's see, I've got a little teleprompter here which I've never used before. Let's see, try to remember, build out the space. Yes, building out the space. Um, let's see if I can, I'll, I'll get to this one first. So one of the programs I developed was this internship program that I started talking to RPI, Siena, Union, a lot of colleges around. And the idea was really, how are we gonna really try to you know, build a community, particularly around students, because that was a big focus of it. Uh, and, and so I developed this little, little program that would commit like a multi-term commitment from students, say, hey, you know, you sign up for three terms and I'm gonna teach you the technologies, I'm gonna really teach you how to be a professional, right, work with a multi-dimensional multidisciplinary teams and do good things. And at the end of these three terms, you'll kind of graduate and you go out to the world, you'll be an amazing professional. It gives you the opportunity to learn the technologies, maybe modify your academic path as you're learning and you're like, wow, well, this stuff isn't as fun as I thought it was. You mean I need to learn statistics to do this stuff? I don't want to do that. I get it. You know, so it gives you the chance to kind of modify your academic path while you're still in school and not saying, gee, if I, was, if I knew now what I did then, I'd change this, that, and the other thing, which I did a number of times myself. And the, so, so really the idea was, can we begin to engage companies in the local area to donate, sponsor projects, whatever, get students to start working on it, so that way we can have the students not only develop skills, but build relationships with local, local companies, have those guys stick around, all those kinds of good things. And then, of course, we add a little regional connectivity initiative which said, you can talk about all the great things you want about the Capital District, it's a cool place to live, but trying to just read a little brochure to a student ain't gonna keep them here. You know, so we really need to actually let them experience it. And so you wanna sponsor a project? Great, every Friday we're going to Saratoga, we're gonna go skiing, we're gonna do this stuff. And so after these three terms, these guys, these students are like, this stuff's pretty cool. I mean, the universities do a great job pulling students into the area and we do a great job of getting rid of them. You know, and that's not a good idea. So anyway. So that's what this was designed to do. The other piece is we developed this idea of a neural network. And the neural network was like, look, well, how are we gonna just build a community of people within, the, within, within New York State and the Capital District? So the idea was, I actually went through and, and we identified like 200 people, professors at universities and other people that are in the Capital District doing something with AI. And so what I wanna do is kind of we get this thing back up and running again, and for it to be a resource for people who are just looking to figure out, okay, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, where can I go? It gives me the opportunity to really, you know, help network and build a, build a community. So I think it's one of those fundamental tools you need to start building a community. So if anybody's interested in participating and being part of this thing, my, my contact information will be up later, just email me, send me a little something about what your interest is. We're gonna get that up and running, and we're gonna see if we can start building, you know, a little community around that. So that's one of the starting points. Neural network. The other thing was, I'm like, okay, we do something cool in the area, but how do we really start to go beyond the capital district with this stuff? So the idea was, 
And I created an AI channel. If you want to learn about AI today, you go to Google, you, you go to 20 places, and it's all over the place. Can we create something, really a curated channel? You can download on Google, uh, you know, on your Apple television thing. And it's actually a branded mechanism that we could use to extend the brand outside of the Capital District, even nationally, who knows what. So the idea is, can we create a curated channel of AI content? And it could be about what's happening in universities. It could be research. It's, we'd have content generated from the AI Center, all that kind of stuff. So another program that we would like to launch. And then, like I said, the building. Great building. Yeah, get a picture. No, there's other stuff that we need to do about it. OK, so then I decided, well, it's great to do this, but everything's virtual. And I'm tired of everything being virtual. We need something real. And a building, I think the value of buildings has been greatly underestimated or undervalued. And I really value buildings, like now. And I hope everybody, after going through COVID, they really value buildings now, <laughs> you know, and getting in person, doing things in person. So I actually built a, bought a, a building across the street, across and, and basically right over there. It was a former Masonic temple. It's a really cool building. It needs a little bit of love and care. Uh, but uh, it was a Masonic temple up to the 70s, and then the county bought it, and it's been a senior. It was a senior center, still technically is. They're moving out, I think, at the end of the month. Um, Yes, 19th Street, yes. Oh, I just thought they were moving out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the seniors left. As soon as COVID hit, all the seniors themselves were out, was out. And then they were just doing Meals on Wheels for the last two and a half years. And they have a new, a new building, a new center they just built a few blocks up, so they're moving out over the next couple of years. Anyway, so that just means I have no more excuses for putting off the work I need to do. Damn it. That was really convenient. And it needs work, but it's a pretty cool space. Um, we have different events. Actually, for this, this uh, uh, Temple or lodge, whatever. We do stuff there that's really cool. Most people, they walk in, they don't even know it existed. And so it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice space. I'm, it's a public space at this point. If anybody wants to do anything cool, you're welcome to use it. The, yeah, rent, is, the, the rent is really low. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yes. Right now, there's two different lodges. Yeah. You got it. See that? Public space. I mean, the circus has probably been there for a while. Uh, maybe I'll also mention there's a mirror of that mezzanine on the other side as well. The, the... Oh, over that, that one there is. Yeah, uh, there's the other. The, there's a second mezzanine on the back side. So it's like oh, yeah, yeah, double yeah. that oh, yeah, size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll have our next meeting will be over there. I'm sorry. What, what yes. Nineteenth Third uh, Street. Uh, let's see. How are we doing on time here? It doesn't quite look like uh, it doesn't quite look like that picture on the left, but someday it will. I hope. <laughs> Where that? Okay, so basically, it's uh, almost thirty thousand square feet, so it's a good sized building. Uh, the downstairs, there was some retail space way back when. Uh, the goal will turn that into a co-working space at some point. Uh, there's a commercial kitchen. I have this idea of creating this AI cafe, which is a cafe environment infused with AI, so people can go in and kind of see, you know, it becomes kind of a living laboratory for people to kind of play with to see how people react to different things. Uh, that's aspirational. That's aspirational. Put an asterisk next to that one. I think it'd be really cool. My, the whole point is, you know, I, I say this, and I don't mean to be critical, but if anyone walked down the, down the streets of Troy, you'd never know that there was how many video game studios here? What's going on here? I mean, it's the best kept secret. We just don't show it off, and it's ridiculous. So the reason I bought the building and the reason I want to do the AI Cafe is I want people to come in off the street and really experience what we're doing. You know, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to help create excitement about it. It's going to help. It helps the community, right? So that's what I want to do. Um, second floor, actually, where... My offices are now, so it's uh, it's office space, and we've got a couple of organizations. In fact, David back there is, is in the space. Uh, we've got a few organizations in there uh, working now, and we want to expand that. And then the third is these two uh, the two lodges that you saw those pictures of. They're really big open spaces, pretty cool. You know, one of them I, I would like. The original intent was to make it sort of a hardware lab laboratory because there's I think an opportunity for the capital district, and I think it's becoming more obvious now is is AI embedded in hardware, you know, in the Internet of Things and those kinds of things. And we've got this tremendous experience and capability around chip manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. A natural place is to, uh, is to have more, you know, AI embedded in hardware type initiatives going on. And, and quite frankly, that it's quite strategic because if you think about it, if we're in a situation where new chips are being built 
and we can get in, we can develop the operating systems for those chips. We're in a real strong competitive advantage to build applications on top of it and really take a leadership position even in the country. So I think we have a real opportunity to do that. Uh, just have to coordinate all the resources in the area. That's the trick. And that's kind of it. Um, yeah, that's it. That's long the short of it. So uh, you'll have my contact information. Love to have you just reach out if you want to participate in some way, shape, or form. And as we move forward, we'll kind of build out some of these programs and, and then give you a tour of the building next time and, and take from there. Building actually up and running. Right. Uh, the building is running as a building. <laughs> yes. And I'll end it at that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't need to work, you were saying, but is there anything going on in it? Like well, yeah, I mean, my office is there. We've got, uh, there's three companies in there now. So David is a, is a startup, AI startup. There's another AI startup there. And then Scantaplan uh, is a startup company. They're there. So there's three companies in there now, and my and de facto is in there. So we're there. Uh, it's not... Hundreds of people, but we're getting there. We got, we do have life. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. The building is absolutely. Well, there's plenty of yoga happening in there too. <laughs> well, there's yeah. I mean, there yes, there is. And so, so the building is used for non-technical things also. So, there up until last week, there were yoga classes almost every day. There's actually. What kind of, some kind of dancing on Sundays. There's a, yeah, there's different things that happen. If anybody needs a place to do something interesting, just reach out to me. And yep, I think it's at the end. Yep. Yeah, it's on the last slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty much it. I guess we'll write uh, you. And I have a content as well. So. And here's Bob's contact information. And uh, my name's Adam Oh, uh, we'll come back to it. It's going to be on the last slide. Are you going to be here in about 10 minutes? It'll be on there. So. Yeah. So, um, so my name's Adam Shmigowski. I work for a company called Monatical. I'm you know, supporting Bob in this vision as being one of the players in this space, in this ecosystem. Um, I did business development there, so it's really just how do we translate wild technologies, very basic technologies, and how do we make them into positive impact, I should say. Right? And if it's not positive, we fix that, right? Um, my company, we thrive with open source, and we do a lot of bleeding edge web development and data science work. We also are you know, actively working with uh, existing development teams to help them with some of their learning goals and um, you know, working on pieces of the roadmap that they you know, don't have enough time to handle. So. Um, so AI translation, to take a little bit of what Bob had shared and bring it to uh, like a practical business level along with what he does daily at de facto global intelligence AI, it's really about um, you know, introducing a, the upcoming series that Bob mentioned, like finding ways that make AI practical for local businesses. Um, so talking about how to apply data science, how to do machine learning, how to do development operations, and basically spinning up instances of the software that's being built in various places, right? Um, the most important thing is, you know, understanding why a business is doing this in the first place. What are their goals? Like, how is this even going to be a, a, a helpful effort for them, right? The second part is really understanding the data. What is the information I've had? I had a couple of conversations in the audience uh, before we started, and it was really just trying to understand, okay, if we have, um, you know, data entry, how do we make sure that's being done in a clean and concise way, in a practical way, that we can then utilize that? The third part is beginning to apply analytics. So getting reports that are going to help us to do day-to-day -day real optimizations of work that we're doing procuring uh, products, for example, right? Getting feedback on uh, predictive maintenance that we should be doing on our, our large-scale equipment, or even our, our, our uh, kind of, you know, we, I heard a comment about food service businesses. That there'll be an example here later. Um, and also even just the basic tasks that many of us deal with daily of aggregating internal knowledge and finding who's worked on this already, what's a summary of what they've done that's relevant to me and that's applicable and doing a better job with my work. Um, so that's really getting into the part about applying analytics. And then the last part is the really scary part. It's, it's automating our operations and relinquishing some sort of uh, you know, human intervention in that process. It's knowing that, hey, we have complete control of this 
um, this flow of information. We know what we want to do when that happens, and we're going to set up a piece of equipment to operate on that. That's happening every day all around us, as much as we don't even know about it, right? That's called boring AI. Um, but it's really just pursuing that and getting further in that mission. So that's, that's AI translation. Um, so does anybody know what this is? Chick-fil-A, OK. So one question, if answered perfectly, would make Chick-fil-A a fluid success. How many waffle fries should be in the fryer right now? As simple as that sounds, just putting waffle fries in a fryer, that is what drives this business every day. That's why uh, Chick-fil-A is able to output three times more volume as um, in many of their locations as when they were initially designed. Because it becomes so popular, people love their product, they need to be able to put it out consistently. right? Um, they have a variety of really robust systems, which I'll, I'll introduce here briefly to talk about how they apply AI at the edge, how they have computers and compute devices in their kitchens at all of their 2,900 locations that allow them to be incredibly efficient with something as simple as waffle fries that everybody, I think, would enjoy. Right? Um, so step one is they're, they're collecting the data. This is going back to the example I shared about AI translation. Let's make it real. right? So step one is collecting the data. Um, they have a variety of on-site devices that are connected to their point of sale that do what's called data ingestion, and they put the relevant information in a structured format in a place that they can then reference it. Then that is created into what's called a time series, where they have logs of when things happened. They can monitor and see the state of, okay, let's say how much product they have, how many people have ordered in the last hour, what's the weather, um, and then getting alerts when somebody has to actually do something. Somebody has to make a product, or somebody has to serve something, or somebody has to order something. Right? So that's collecting the data in a relevant way. Then they have a way to start to improve the operations. This is where we talked about the idea of analytics and helping people make good decisions. So um, they have inventory management reports, so they know how much they need to order. Right? Sounds pretty basic. Then they have kitchen display systems that are based on a lot of real-time information. This is what people are producing. It's even before orders are coming in, they have information that basically says, OK, somebody is about to order this. They haven't paid for it yet, but they're thinking about ordering it. Somebody's already typed it on the POS, and it's already happened at 30 of the other locations in this region. So we better be spinning up more chicken sandwiches and more waffle fries. Um, and then they do some really amazing stuff with uh, deployment management. So they have a small team of people working at their headquarters, and those are then servicing the um, small businesses at 2,900 locations across the country. Because you don't have an AI expert at every Chick-fil-A, but they really appreciate the service that it provides. So they have the Chick-fil-A headquarters. Um, there's a great blog called Chick-fil-A Tech Blog where they write about what they're doing. Um, and this is kind of a summary of what they're doing, which is I love how transparent they are. And then it's uh, enabling the automation. So they're taking that transactional sales data, like who's buying what, where are they buying it, um, from all the restaurants, all the locations. And they combine that with real-time stuff that somebody's actually typing in, hey, somebody would like uh, three Chick-fil-A chicken sandwiches. Then they combine that with what's actually being cooked on the line, what's already in the fryers. And then they do micro adjustments, that the people that work in there have an intuitive sense of how the business operates, what are they sensing, what are they seeing. They do micro adjustments. And they leverage that to get one thing, which is what I started this, this slide with, which is a forecast of how many waffle fryers should be in the fryer every minute of the whole day. So that then they know what they've got to do their work. They're doing it. And then people are happy. And uh, there's less waste. It's more energy efficient. Um, and they can run a better business and offer better prices and better compensation for the team. So anyway, all the beautiful things that we'd like a business to operate with, um, that's how it happens. So uh, getting away from the whole nebulous idea of AI translation and kind of gave you like a really tactical example so that next time you're having some waffle fries, you can think about it. Um, I want to give some tricks for all you ecosystem builders in the audience here. So um, my goal is to help you save at least a couple minutes, at least a couple times a day reliably. Um, and the whole idea is that once you see intelligence on demand working, you really can't unsee it. Like once it gets in your head to think about, OK, how could I do this in a better way? Um, how can I spend more time being a productive member, having co like strong conversations with my team versus like r sorting something endlessly for that, that's maybe not very fun or practical? Um, once you see that, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? So I'll give a practical example that I utilized while um, Bob, Dan, and I are working on setting up this evening for everybody. Um, uh, somebody wrote LLM on that screen earlier, a large language model. So um, the idea is that 
all of us all day, what we do is we take information from one format and we bring it to another, right? Maybe we, we look at it and we say, okay, this is what's relevant for my community. Or maybe we look at it and we say, okay, it should really be presented in a different order, right? That's what we do when we write an email, when we um, develop a spreadsheet. Um, that's what we're doing every day. Um, and um, a lot of you have seen wild examples online of ChatGPT. I think, how many, by show of hands, have, have heard of ChatGPT here? Almost everyone, great. So ChatGPT is a large language model, and that is powered by what is called a transformer. And transformers are a computer science uh, a fundamental, um, pretty recent one, I should say. And what they do is they transform. So let's take a look at that. So um, on the left is an example of uh, the list of uh, people that we invited to come here tonight. Um, and uh, very quickly, it wasn't in order and it wasn't bulletin. And I just had to send an email. So I said, okay, can you please sort it and bullet it for me? And it did it. And I didn't have to go line by line, backspace, enter. Da, da. I wasn't using a word processor. So very simple example of, hey, just sort and bullet text for me. It's a little process I came up with randomly on the moment, and it executed it, right? You've probably seen examples like this. Another example is I wanted to expand the text. So for a general audience, people may not know what the Rensselaer County IDA is, Rensselaer County Industrial Development Agency. So I said, okay, just can you please expand the abbreviated text because I'm sending this to people and instead of going line by line and looking at it, can you expand it for me? Great, did that and it worked. Another example is visualizing text. Um, so this is an email I had going with my team and we were talking about some steps in um, basically creating um, an archive of a website and there's a couple people going back and forth on it. And yeah, you could certainly read the email and understand or comprehend it, but I wanted to very quickly um, create a, a graphic, which I apologize, is a little bit small here, that basically just shows the process flow. So we had to do two things up top, and then we did four things in a row. So it was written in text, and I said, hey, can you please give this to me in what's called graph viz notation? Um, other things that you could use are what's called BPMN, or business process modeling notation. And it's very commonly used to describe, okay, how, what do we do every day? How do we go from A to Z, right? Um, how do we go from a bag of waffle fries to a beautiful hot red pouch of waffle fries, right? So there's probably 40 steps. So anyway, visualizing that and educating people on what are we doing every day, that's, that, that's a complicated process. We, we all do it every day. So going from a visual explanation to a notation to a nice clean graphic, right? Again, this took a couple seconds to do it. Um, so does everybody remember when Siri launched in 2011? Is yeah, somewhat, maybe, okay. Um, have you ever used it and said, oh man, that's not exactly what I was hoping for? Maybe. Um, well today I wanna say I'm here to launch Siri Pro. Just kidding. Um, but not really. Um, so we've talked about large language models are these things you throw stuff at it it transforms it and then you look at it and you're like wow this is this is what i wanted maybe it's not let me throw it back and let me take it back right so it, it's a thing that you work with right um so ChatGPT is a large language model that many of us have kind of already had experience with but there's many of them out there a lot of companies are producing them you're hearing on the news certainly but there's a lot of individual companies producing their own to answer the question about how do we have large language models not being dependent on existing corpuses, you can take your internal uh, team support documents you write for each other. You can take the emails that you've written for the last five years to your customers to explain how to fix that thing when the button changes colors, right? Um, you can take that information and you can use that as a training set to then allow them to have access to your training documentation like incredibly fast and easily without waiting 24 hours or two days for an email response. I mean, you might handle 98% requests and satisfy people in the way that they feel empowered with their information. So long story short, Siri Pro is a, a large language model that you can access via an iOS shortcut if you have an iOS device. Um, in this case, it is using the OpenAI large language model, which is one of the ways that um, ChatGPT works. And you can basically ask it a question. Um, so I gave a quick example of Siri Pro being kind of underwhelming. On the left, I said, what are some practical ways of applying natural language processing, which is a, uh, a term that's used to describe how we get these like kind of uh, elegant interfaces to ask questions and get an answer back in natural language. Um, so on the left, you can see it didn't answer my question, Siri, I should say. It gave me a definition of what natural language processing is. 
But um, OpenAI's large language model, which is trained on a lot more information, it actually gave me some examples. It said, okay, chatbots, voice search, text classification. So that's, that actually answered my question. Um, so this, the point of this demonstration is really to show that as you become familiar with all these different consumer, consumable uh, resources like Bob mentioned, you can really be in control of how you interact with them. So this is just a simple way to say, hey, um, you, know, you can make your own iOS shortcut access your own large language model, be it a public one like OpenAI or one that your company develops itself. If you do want the shortcut, see me afterward, I can, I can share it with you. Um, so one last example I'll share is, uh, anybody here familiar with Richard Feynman? Okay, we got a couple people, okay. So he's an uh, uh, American physicist, um, active in the Manhattan Project. Um, one thing that he was famous for beyond that is just very succinctly describing complicated topics, which is something I'm trying to do tonight. Maybe I'm remotely doing that. Um, so he realized like using uh, complicated di dialogue to describe something simple was really not valuable. Um, and he developed this thing called the Feynman Technique. It's how we educate a lot of the people working with him on how to really understand these complicated concepts that they were working with and how to make the connection so they could intuitively have a solid grasp on it, which is really what we try to do every day as we educate ourselves on how to use a new tool, right? Know how the pieces work together. Um, if it wants to do a software update, it's not gonna do that. Um, so this is an example of a prompt. Maybe some of you have heard of the idea of prompts or prompt engineering where you write text out and you then give it to the large language model, ChatGPT, and then get an answer, right? So this one right here is very simple. It says, let's discuss a topic or a concept that I'm curious about. You're gonna ask me questions. Um, we'll approach this with an open mind, we'll be curious, and my goal is to learn more, let's begin. So if you, you know, take a screenshot of this and copy it later and type it in ChatGPT, you'll actually flip the dialogue. So instead of you asking ChatGPT to answer questions, it will start asking you questions. And it'll say, hey, so what do you know about that complicated topic? And you'll say, well, I know this, and then I know this, and I know this. And then that's gonna start to be you thinking about, hey, what do I really know? And then it's gonna ask you a question to follow up. And you will be basically interviewing with this entity, and you'll be able to concretely understand, I really don't understand that thing. So maybe let me go spend some time, read and learn and understand that. So it's just a really fun way to um, go beyond just reading a book and then trying to like practice and seeing how do these concepts correlate. So for the educators out there, give this a shot. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. Um, and the last example I'll share is uh, custom large language models. And again, apologies, LLMs are large language models. Um, so I described the example earlier that if you have a ton of information, which is what's called a corpus in the question there, um, you can utilize that to start to, um, uh, you know, create a training data set and then have a relevant service internally that you and your team use or maybe your customers use or maybe the people who are at the facility you um, are working use. Um, it's a really excellent, simple um, description of this. You can read on Prompt Engineering 101 uh, by a company called Human Loop. It's a really nice blog post that helps you start to write things like this that um, uh, would leverage a, a data set you have, either a public language model or one that your, your company eventually develops internally, which that will be, more of that will be happening in the next couple of years. Um, and with that, opening up to Q&A about the Technology Center of Gravity, the AI Center of Excellence, and just general questions. Yeah, I guess I'm diving into the. Uh, yeah, it's the video. Okay, I guess I'm diving into the part where you're talking about the research, Adam, because uh, you know one of the things that's starting to come out about these models is that they're very confident in providing answers even when they don't have the correct answer. So how do you really uh, mitigate that to ensure that uh, if people are increasingly leaning on these technologies to provide them with their information? that there's some veracity to the information and not leading people down wrong paths. I know there was just a uh, 
interview on the round table with, uh, what's his name? He's our and he ran a question about the round table. And it said that the round table was no longer there. It had finished in 2019 and that the host was retired. And here they were last week talking on the show. So yeah. it's, it seems like a big problem. I, I can answer it from my own perspective. But on to Bob and others to kind of maybe chime in. This is an awesome question. Um, so for me, when I started to see the whole thing of fake news emerge, it was the same question, like how do we make people critical of the information they're being presented with? So I think it's exactly the same problem as fake news, and I'm grateful that people are slowly becoming aware of that and are starting to...
So that's a good thing. Now, in terms of how you make that available to everyone, again, I mean, I take a look at what's happening uh, with uh, these large language models and, and everything that's happening in this new wave of AI, it is out there. I mean, for every, uh, three years ago, four years ago, if I was asked a question, how many people have played with Azure Machine Learning? I would tell you there wouldn't be a lot of people in this room that would raise their hand, I would guess, right? So how many people four or five years ago play with Azure Machine Learning? One, okay, two, right? I, now- Azure was a cloud. Yeah, exactly. But now you asked a question about chat GPT and everybody raised their hand pretty much. I mean, I, I didn't see everybody, but pretty much. That's consumerizing AI. Let's make it available. So I think that young people who would not have access to it before will have access to it, even without having to physically get transported to someplace like this. But uh, that's, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, part of the reason I got the center is to try to engage that same problem. And even while I was working with BOCES and those types of organizations to figure out how can we start building literacy, K through 12, exposing people, it's a big problem, it's a big issue, it's a big thing that needs to, get happen, needs to happen. Uh, what was the name of that? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. But you're it in Troy, right? Um, maybe. So I don't even know how to, because this language is new, you just hear me out. Okay, yep. And you said this is available in a lot of places, and it might be, and, and look at this wrong. Yep. Right? I'm saying, because Troy has a lot of violence, right? Mm -hmm. And last year, we had, I'm a pastor, by the way. Last year, we had a community initiative at the riverfront where we had young people, the church, and the world, so to speak, for lack of a better word. You know what I mean by that? And then some kids, hardcore, coming out of prison, others in the streets, and I brought the church. And it was very interesting to see, but they did things together, mm -hmm. right? Some of the kids couldn't even read. Some of them didn't even know where the riverfront was before that. So my thing is, if I can get these babies to you in your program, how could we help them? Or maybe you're not Heather. understanding. No, I understand. I mean, I... He doesn't have a formalized... But I think for a resource in Troy, if you want young people to get integrated into science and technology, Sanctuary for Independent Media is doing that now with the science lab. I didn't know I, that. I would have oh my God, they've got tremendous resources. I didn't know that. Yep. And that's their main mission. That is a, their main mission. So get a radio. I think flip for that community. I'm also working with Albany Could Code, uh, right? Well, because uh, that's part of their mission also. And we're working to develop AI content for their programs. And before a lot of that, going back to the technical dimension, was what well, I'm going to teach people who may not have the opportunity to learn R or Python, you know, and teach those technical skills. And that's great. But now there's the opportunity to just to teach those same people how to use some of these tools to accomplish things they wouldn't be able to do before. So in a way, again, it, it broadens the opportunity for people. But they just have to, they need the, need the mechanism to, to get exposed to it and learn. And organizations yeah. like Albany Can Code, I mean, the schools have an awareness of this. BOCI certainly does. Um, and that's, that's a growing awareness for sure. David, remember I sent you over that there was an organization, national organization, that's looking to drive literacy, K through 12. I don't remember the name of the organization, but they're really working with Microsoft, Google, all the large, uh, all the large technology companies. A not for profit that's also uh, driving programs for that same purpose. So the good news is it's a very, it's a known issue, and it's things that there's a bunch of organizations nationally, even locally, that are addressing. I think Bob also like how you mentioned, you know, you drive down the street, and you have no idea what's going on in Troy. Right. You know, if you did, once you get that building, like the facade done, you have AI Center of Excellence yeah. there, and you have information in the windows. You know, I can't tell you how many people, they walk by these windows every day, and they just ring the doorbell, and they're like, this place seems cool. What, what is this place? And you just get people in the community walking around, and then they start going, oh, I can use a 3D printer. I can use a CNC machine. Having that, that once we start getting that physical visibility, and you just have people walking around, that, that does yeah. make a huge impact it, as far it as like, boots on the ground. It really does. So. And there was also, I'm not going to uh, you know, put anybody on the spot, but there are a couple of curriculum designers in the audience. If they want to chime in or anything, I'm just going to throw that out there. So. Yeah. Questions? You just talk. Oh, okay. Ignore um, So just uh, going off of the whole, moving on to the subject of equity, and I think personally one of the main problems is access to Mm 
Mm -hmm. It's also really hard to set up on your own. Um, and to start playing around with AI, you have to have a significant amount of compute. So just wondering, in your plan for uh, this center that you're trying to construct, is, is uh, access to compute part of your plan? Uh, there was that dimension, and moving forward, I, um, not sure yet. So the answer would be, I would make, like to make those resources available, but I'll put a little ne asterisk next to that one. Yes, David. I was going to say, Bob, related to the analytics lab, that might be some, one of the things that get considered there, whether we're looking for sponsors to help us with get access, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, actual housing power to be able to go through that. Yeah, so one of the things we were, we're looking to do is to build an, an analytics lab in the building for that purpose. So, and David actually is, is helping with that. Yes? Yeah, so there's two aspects, or there's like two paths you can go down. You can buy physical computers yourself mm. right. and try and install them with the 12.6 software and traceability. The more fruitful avenue will probably be going directly to like AWS and like Google Cloud. Yeah. And working in an agreement with them to get cloud credits. Like a common thing with startup funding and startup accelerators is that is one of the dimensions uh, compensation for being a program is they get a certain amount of like let's say a hundred thousand in cloud credits mm -hmm. and these can pay for GPUs, they can pay for software because a lot of these like when you actually develop a machine learning system you're going to need to not only develop the GPUs, you're going to want to store, you're going to want to have a database, you're going to need network connections, you're going to need all these things that the cloud providers provide in a very straightforward and easy to use way. And that may be easier to try to run your own GPUs. Right. Yeah, yeah. It might be to try yeah they, and I know they offer those to students, right? And I haven't fully explored what type of programs would be available to an organization like ours, although the, the AI Center is a not-for-profit, so, you know. But, yeah, I guess, why does it, question? Yeah, just following up on that, um, what involvement do you have with what they're doing at UAlbany with AI supercomputing? initiative they're doing over there? Well, um, I was working with them four years ago, five years ago, and kind of, kind of was kind of singing my tunes over there in terms of why we should have this ecosystem and what we're trying to do. Uh, so uh, I haven't really been in touch with them recently. I, I've been, I was in touch with the Nanotechnology Center, you know, because I was working with those guys. But again, a lot of that stuff, when COVID hit, everything just kind of went sideways. Uh, I'm getting more engaged with RPI. Uh, want to get back engaged with UAlbany uh, and all those things. So, so this is, as I said, kind of a restart and trying to renew those relationships and kind of get some of those conversations going again. But yeah, those are the types of resources that if we can just coordinate, we can do amazing things. We've got yeah. tremendous and, resources. And that was part of my intention of being, working with Bob and Dan on this evening to kind of start the conversation um, you know, raise awareness, you know, kind of perk up everybody's ears and all these like different pockets of, of work that's happening and start to facilitate um, connections like that. And I went to the UAlbany Symposium in November. It was uh, a, four hours of lightning talks. It was awesome to kind of just see like three minutes on like really in-depth technology. Some of them are way over my head. Some of them are really digestible, but I got to really see all the, the various work that's happening. Um, they talked a lot about that initiative. Um, and I know we have a member in the audience from the um, RPI's supercomputing. Um, we talked about it briefly before um, the talk tonight that, you know, those are conversations that are happening and it's, I'm excited to understand more about how, you know, how are they going to make that presentable. At the symposium, they did talk about um, trying to expose that compute to students, um, but I'm curious how much utilization are they going to have left over in the early days of that. Um, that would be applicable to um, you know people through an entity such as AI Center of Excellence or others. So, yeah, that's I'm just going to put that out there. I'm trying to make those connections myself in support of all this. So, mm -hmm. so um, Bob, we you know you've talked a little bit about reengaging uh, the universities. What other resources can the region offer you that you would need? Um, outside of what we've talked about with the universities? Um, hmm. Let me try to answer that question. 
Of course, it always starts with money. But that's, you mean besides money? Nothing else. Money right here on the Yeah, not much else, I guess. Just money. Just money. No, no, no. I think that um, you know. The, so I, I, I put together, I put together a whole plan for this stuff, and realized that it was. Um, I, I'm really just let me hold off on answering that question because I, I'd like to have something that's very concrete and reasonable. Um, so that's fair. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I say money, I of course. That but money doesn't answer, doesn't do everything for you. I mean, I think what's more important is really getting community engagement now and really trying to build. Like I said, it's really beginning to build the community. And I think if we can do that, then I'd like to bubble up from there. I, I don't want to start at the top and work my way down. I kind of started that before, and, and as I mentioned, what happens is you get publicity, you're, all of a sudden you get these high expectations, and you're living up to other people's expectations, and it's, it's a heavy burden to carry when you're carrying everybody else's expectations around with you, particularly when you start a little project that you thought was kind of fun to do. So I'm taking the low-key approach, and <laughs> like, let's build the community and see where it goes, you know? No, I, I, yeah, we went through, I had about 200 people that I identified, professors and all that kind of, I mean, that, that, that list is about three years old, now I've got to dust that off and, and resurface it. The idea was, if I can identify professionals and people in the space and I put them up on this neural network, then the question would be if I can use that as be a sort of a, a mechanism for connecting everyone in the region, that'd be really a great asset. Uh, and then what would happen is, People would start coming to the center, looking for expertise, and we could start building, you know, we can start building on that, building projects, building expertise, competency, skills, all that kind of stuff. That's a, I think it's a fundamental building block to what we're trying to do. I was just wondering if you're finding clusters of, you know, where, where the focus is. Well, this was, I had one of my employees, I said, I won't go through every university in New York State, <laughs> identify anybody who's in an AI program, any expertise, I want it all cataloged. And that's what it was, what it, that's what it is. I've got to go back and see. I'm sure some of it's still very relevant. And then I've got to go through and get approval from them to kind of participate in this thing and everything else. But that was really the starting point. That was the whole intent. Is there another model like this in other, in other states that you've seen? Um, Adam and well, I we actually did, we went up to- We talk about Montreal. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, Adam and I went up to Montreal a couple of weeks ago because they've been doing this stuff for a while. Uh, the government decided they're going to throw, I think it was up to $500 million into five different regions to set up these, these centers, more or less. Not quite, not quite like this, but generally speaking. I mean, the whole goal was to do, do very similar things. So here it is, I don't know how many years later, three, four, five years later, they've dispersed hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars. And what Canada has realized is we're really good at research. We're not so good at commercializing stuff. You're like, well, you don't exactly have the population and the economy to do it, right? So we were up there, A, to kind of just connect New York, you know, what they're doing to what we're doing down here. And, I've, and anyone who's heard there was a, a recent announcement of this Canadian New York State Alliance, which is pretty cool. So we're up there really trying to say, hey, look, we're just going to learn from what you want to do. And if we can be a channel to help, com help companies in our region, you know, be more AI competent or whatever. And if it's your technology they use, it's fine with us, right? So we went up there really to learn and try to learn what models we might be able to, to adopt here. And it was pretty interesting. But again, it was, they, they, tended, they ended up being, they're very heavily research focused because it's kind of easy to be research focused. They have a lot of, they have, a, what I was interested in is they have a, one organization up there that does a lot with universities. They get companies to sponsor projects, you know, and they have a membership into this, into the, into the group, and they get to share the research and that kind of stuff. It's a really great model, and it was a model that I think, uh, you know, I'm looking to to see if we can structure something similar to that. So, but I don't think there's, I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm sure there's other places in the country now that may be doing this. Five, six years ago there wasn't. Maybe there is now. Um. Yeah, if I, could, if I could just add to that, um, um, the entities we met with were Mila, which is the researchers that, that Bob mentioned, and they, um, they have this thing called the technical readiness level, TRL. It's a, I, I think it's very widely used in Canadian mm -hmm. government technical projects. Um, but they specifically said they were working on the one to four level, which is that research level. And I think a lot of the stuff that we would like to do, which is more practical, like day to day, like, you know, the Chick-fil-A example, it's like you have real business with real information, with real output and real people trying to do a better job. 
um, that's like the seven, eight, nine level. So some of the research where, again, it's easier to put money into research and get out, output, but then to, you know, make that be utilized by an organization that has, you know, 50,000 employees, that's, that's the next level. Um, so, but they, you know, my company has been doing some contracts with some companies that have been coming out of that. So small companies, 10, 15, 20 people, um, that, you know, would get, you know, a couple months worth of, uh, funding. Um, to build out a product and then they got a lot of traction and people were excited about it and they can't do all the work and they need extra entities to come in. So we've helped them in that sense. Um, and um, the people in Montreal, were, uh, uh, they're very professional with how they spend their money. They go through an incredibly rigorous process to identify these people and put um, uh, process checks along the way and really be very rigorous. It's not just like a blank check. Hey, just let's, let's, you know, hope something happens. It's like a very, very regimented, disciplined funnel, and there's a lot of funnels, funnels for funnels. Um, so they're pretty good at that, I would say. Yeah, and the, and the universities played a big role there. We're, we're not, I don't think, I don't see us doing research and development, just working with the universities who are doing research and development, and really trying to help them find pathways to the market for their stuff. And in fact, I know RPI, with a new president, if anyone has heard him, uh, it's one of the one of the five key goals he has is to really build pathways from taking this stuff that's happening up on the hill and getting into the marketplace, and so I'm working with them in that regard. And so things like that start happening. It's really going to help this capital district tremendously. The stuff that's happening at U Albany, those are the types of things you need those engines to sort of create opportunities, you know, for commercial ventures. And so the more we can see, even those universities doing more in the research area and then being, a, being open to get spring that stuff out, it's gonna help, that's just really gonna drive the economies around here. You know? And we wanna just really try to help facilitate that stuff. Who's next? Oh, there's definitely a need for, for skills. Um, I would say that, again, I'm going back, and when I spoke with GE Research prior to COVID, they had a big problem. You know, they were like, hey, we, we get these AI resources from Boston, New York. They come to Capital District. They say six months, and they leave, right, and they're gone. And so there was a real problem trying to attract and retain skilled AI uh, professionals in the region uh, Certainly through the eyes of GE Research, which is an organization which I had talked to. I don't know how many other companies in the area were necessary, who have really sort of started, uh, you know, implementing and using AI, you know, uh, aside from companies who maybe were specifically decided, you know, where they're going to be, where they're going to be AI startups. We have started talking to more companies in the area just to try to create an awareness of what they can do. Uh, like predictive maintenance and those types of things, and it intrigued them. They hadn't gotten there yet, so um, so I don't know if there's I don't know really what the demand is in the in the capital region here for for those types of skills, uh, but nationally, there's oh, tremendous amount. Good comment. Um, we're using the term AI, but embedded in AI, there's a lot of statistical Absolutely. analysis and a whole bioinformatics. So. You know, it's a big area, and you know, from some of the job boards during the week, I, I'm like, they're looking for, you know, ten statistical programmers. You know, like weekly, I get these emails. So there's there's a lot of need for it, and there's a, you know, and depending on if you want to take the spin into the high tech areas of semiconductors, there's a lot of positions yeah, out there. I, I would yeah, say. At, at the nanotech, um, <laughs> the U Albany Symposium I mentioned earlier, like at the end, like there's some heart to heart frank conversations where it's basically like, well, we can't get enough people here to do like the really advanced stuff that we want to do at the capacity that we want to do it. And it was a lot of reference to kind of some comments I made about like, it's kind of a, it's a funnel problem. Like we're just not getting people from outside as Bob mentioned, but we're also not getting people from the region, which is why I'm very excited about Bob's vision presenting like a K through eight literacy program about all the things. I mean, I reference something as non AI as checking your sources, you know, those types of that very broad educational skill set just kind of dovetails into this really intense statistical data collection, analytical mindset that this kind of work necessitates. Yeah, the great thing about what U Albany is doing, and, and uh, I know I talked to him about it long ago, and 
is, is the need for everybody to understand what AI is, because it touches every discipline, right? So if you're a lawyer, you need to understand it. If you're a doctor, any, you need to understand it, and you need to understand what impact it's going to have on what you do, because it is going to have an impact on what you do. Uh, and so that's an important part of literacy, not only from, a, from technical people understanding it, from everybody in every discipline needs to understand it. And then just in that context, and knowing how it works and how it works in the context of big data and systems development, if you have the verb, you know, verbal skills to present it, there's so many opportunities. Just look at the IRS, you know, or, or the state tax, you know, in the context of taxes these days. Huge thing. You can walk in there, you can write that check. Say, hey, look, we can do this for you. Boom. Yeah, that's actually my, my day job is kind of talking to business people and, and translating to them, okay, okay, how much would a project like this cost? Okay, it's not worth it, right? But, okay, like if you can actually get a lot of efficiencies out of this and you have the money to spend on the project and you have the capacity, you have the skills, you have the data, you have every, all the stars line up, then you do it. So, um, to, your, to your point there. Yeah, and just something else I've kind of seen is that you know, now, you know, they're starting to see all this internet security stuff out there and developing AI applications to go around and say, look, your website's off or, you know, doing kind of like, I don't know if it's called a neural network or do kind of like polling, node to node polling to do security assessments and go back to the businesses and say, look, you've got these security holes, you know, we can help you and now you identify all these holes and you know, any business that is serious about doing business is going to pay for the okay. enhancements. Yep. And also, uh, good AI is invisible AI, right? right? I mean, you shouldn't even know that it's there. And we use it, I mean, I mean, everybody's been involved with AI for years and years now, and most times you don't even know it, right? That's the way it's going to be. You're just going to continue doing what we do, just do it better, faster, smarter. Go for it. Sort of making meetings with all of you guys who know what you're talking about here. Um, how do we learn about it? Because we actually we serve you know, K-12 students all over the U.S. Hmm. Um, we're doing a lot of work here in, the, in our communities and in businesses and, and in schools, all the way down to K-8 kind of kids. Live events with students. So we see a lot of the audience that we need to educate, and yet how I educate myself on it. Mm -hmm. um, my background is engineering, but like way back there. Mm -hmm. I have Mm -hmm. uh, I reach out to either one of us, and then uh, that's yeah. one of the things that I'm working with Albany and Code on is a curriculum, seeing how that might be able to be adapt adapted to what you're doing. Um, and, and just being curious, uh, to be honest, I, that's what I tried to do with at least the, the very specific examples I gave, um, of like just seeing that, oh wow, there is this way of operating, and I only focus on large language models, right? We didn't talk about any kind of mathematical process at all. Um, just being curious and just looking at, like, how are people utilizing this and, you know, being just outside your comfort level, I mean. Well, I can't stop thinking about, you said you were sharing example with us earlier about someone who doesn't know how to do anything in software, do something with AI, and all of a sudden they use deep software, and I think you said there's an example. Well, I mean, you can, yeah, I mean, yeah, when you can just put some code into, you know, ChatGPT and it kind of tells you where the bugs are. And, you know, or you, it can write release notes. I mean, it's like, like I'm a software, I'm a software company. Every time there's a new release, you got to write, you got to document, okay, what does this code do now? It can generate release notes for you without, by cutting and pasting. That's not a technical skill, you know? It's amazing. So now, I mean, you still need a human to kind of do that and understand what's going on, but that's, a, that's an example of supplementing skills. You know, that's going to qualify that person to do something they can do before. Go for it. Oh, in the back, and then up here with the hat. Yep. I talked about um, reaching out to businesses, um, but I was wondering if there's any data that's been collected on um, work from home, uh, specifically like professionals in the area that work from home who are in the AI industry and how I don't have any. I don't have any statistics, but I mean, I think what I'd like to do is raise the visibility of what we're doing to try to get those people to be connected. You know. Yeah, we'd love insights like that. We talked about that. How to make the space have some fun. Answer to that. I've already met and introduced and toured the building with several people who work from home in the area. We were just having to find each other. We're desperate for. I, I technically used to work at home before Bob gave me a desk, right? 
<laughs> so, uh, so, you know, with people, with people in, in this space of emerging technology are very much interested in uh, a community of open speakers. And that's the, that's the feedback that I get most from the presenters. That I've met is my expectations. No, I think, there, I think there is definitely need there. I mean, the, the other people. <laughs> yeah, we have a booth in the farmer's market, yes. We sell AI on Saturdays. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I just want to make a point about that. With the speed at, with the speed at which, the speed at which everything is happening, I mean, I think it's going to be hard for individuals to keep up with it, and I think it's just going to drive the need for a community to be working together more and more. I mean, this stuff is moving so quickly, you know. Uh, that's, I think that necessitates the, the, the need for something like this even more than, you know, five years ago. <laughs> An old one that has squirrels running around, bothering nuts, and boilers not working. Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> we had a question, Jasper, right? So I think that I've really come to the conclusion that that's, I think the best approach that we can take is we do bring them in They're at the universities, right? We bring them in from everywhere, thousands of them. We don't need to keep 20,000 of them. We just need to do a good job of, 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 of keeping a reasonable number of them. And that was exactly why I kind of created this internship program that said, this internship program has to add a tremendous amount of value to this person so they really want to continue with it but it also has to have a strong connection to the community have local companies work you know sponsor projects uh, get these get these students initiated to the region to really understand what it's about and it's hard to do that with one term but if they can commit to multiple terms i think that we can develop enough of a relationship and demonstrate enough value and actually get them connected to the region where we'll get a higher hit rate you know and and when we start having a more AI literate community and companies start benefiting from it, there'll be more jobs in that area also. So again, it's one of those things that I think you got to start someplace, you know, and uh, yes. Yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of smart people trying to figure out the answer to that one, the driving the body sphere. I know CEG has an initiative called Cat and Mind that was part of that ACE. I'm a part of it now, but now with you guys from CEG, it's really trying to reach those young professionals and help them Mm. And the cost of living uh, differential compared to being down state. And a lot of people, especially in the creative side of this, you know, we're in the technical side, so it's people that maybe not enough, uh, are choosing to come up here since COVID because of all the reasons that folks who play this like Cat Skill and Troy uh, mm -hmm. having. Yeah, plus, I mean, having jobs here is great, but I think workers are probably going to be choosing lifestyle, right? So much more. So yeah, you really have to amp up the lifestyle dimension, and then because the, because people can work remotely, uh, so that's a. I think that becomes a more important component to to to, to the whole thing. Before people would go because I got the job there, I'm not going. I don't. I'm not going to Troy for the weather, you know. But I've got a job, so I'm going, you know. And. Uh, Yeah, I agree. Yep. And I think we're we're almost at time. We might have room for one more question. I just want to I want to say one thing that I don't want anyone here to hesitate to reach out to Bob or myself. 
Um, like I think uh, personally, my my goal tonight, and I, 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 Bob and Dan know this, was really just to find people who are on this journey, boat ride, mission, walk, whatever you want to call it, and uh, just start start the conversation. It's a long conversation, um, figuring out like practical ways to support each other and uh, you know achieve whatever goals you know we each have at that moment is is going to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, don't hesitate to reach out with the most basic of questions. Um, so yeah, and with that, I think we have time for probably yeah. one more question. I would just say that what I learned is that I can't do all this on my own. And that's kind of why I realized it kind of takes a village, and this is going to take a village. <laughs> I'll, oh, yeah. Hey, Dan, how are you? I was, just, I was just going to say, to your point, your first name? Corey. Corey. So to Corey's point, I love how you, and you're a creative, so it makes sense, but like knitting people and, and knitting together. And so I look forward to working with you to help create those um, connections. Awesome. And you guys heard that, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of witnesses here. <laughs> and along with that, I mentioned earlier that our first event is on smart manufacturing. Well, you know, there's you know, this intersection with smart manufacturing and industry uh, 4.0, which is Internet of Things, that is manufacturing, AI. There's a whole series of those uh, technologies. And we will be having a Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone for coming out. <laughs> so feel free to hang around. Um, you know, we do, like I said, we do these meetups the first Thursday of every month. Uh, we have our newsletter with other events. So um, yeah, hope to see you again sometime in the future. Navi, good to see you again. Long time no see. Yes, yeah. I'll have to come visit you. I haven't seen you over there. I've only been over there a couple times, so I'm going to go. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've basically become a tour guide. <laughs> 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 <laughs>